uh, Tamar Foster, producer of the Pollock Automotive Podcast. And of course, we're here with Bernie Pollock, Pollock Automotive in Vancouver, Vancouver's best auto service experience, 38 years of servicing, repairing, and maintaining cars in Vancouver, BC, Canada, and 20-time winners of Best Auto Repair in Vancouver as voted by their customers. How are you doing this morning, Bernie? Doing well. So uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee 2011 model, what was, there was an engine noise, what was going on with this vehicle? Yeah, this vehicle came to our shop. The owner was complaining of, of, of a ticking sound, a fairly loud clicking sound in the engine. So we uh, had a look at that, did some diagnostic. It definitely wasn't normal. And what did you find was causing the problem? So we, we isolated the problem to the right hand, right cylinder bank. This is, this is a 5.7 liter Hemi V8. Uh, and there was definitely some noise in, in the right hand cylinder bank. So in order to diagnose it further, we, we removed the right valve cover, inspected to see if we could find perhaps a, a loose, you know, a, something loose in the valve train. This is a push rod engine, so the camshaft is located in the center of the V, in the sort of classic spot for a V8, um, and has, you know, has push rods running up to the push rods and rocker arms. We didn't see anything noticeable. We, you know, we ro rotated the engine, ran it. Nothing was, nothing was excessively noticeable noticeable but we were for we were certain that the noise was coming from that side of the engine and doing some you know research into these engines and from some you know personal experience we figured that it was probably possibly a, a worn out lifter or a camshaft problem of some sort what was the next step next step uh removing the engine and um incidentally this engine also had a leaking oil pan gasket which we, which can be done in the car but it's a quite a labor intensive job so at this point we knew we had a uh, internal engine repair to do, uh, an oil pan gasket to repair. So we authorized the client to let's take the engine out and take it apart and find out what's going on. And then we can fix it all in, in one shot. So once you had the engine out, which is a big job and a part, what did you find? So what we found, and we'll just great, get right into the picture show here. We found uh, we did find uh, wear in the camshaft and we found one of the, uh, one of the lifters worn out, the, the, uh, the, these use roller lifters for low friction and that's what we found was worn out. So a combination between that, those two was causing the ticking noise. So there's our nice 2011 Jeep Grand Cherokee, really nice, really nice condition. This vehicle has a, actually pretty low mileage, 100, 114,000 kilometers. So it's still, you know, in my, in my eyes, kind of a brand, brand new vehicle. This is the uh, old and new camshaft. So part of the replacement was to, we had to replace the camshaft. We replaced all the rocker arms, so all, all the lifters. Rocker arms were in good shape. Uh, so the cam and lifters was basically the main component, but we also changed the timing chain and the, uh, the, uh, it has variable valve time. We changed the, vari the variable valve timing actuator gear as well. W while everything is apart, it just kind of makes sense. There's always wear and everything, but this is the new camshaft down here. And if you look up at the old camshaft, you can see worn parts. I'm going to show a closer picture in a second, but you can see this cam lobe is wear. This one has wear. There's wear in several others uh, that's pretty, pretty noticeable. And at 114,000 kilometers, normally that wouldn't necessarily be that apparent. So I wouldn't think so. I, I mean, I think this is I think this is really excessive. But you know, if you do a little research on these engines, there's a lot of problems with these with the rot, with the lifters and camshafts wearing. Uh, we can talk a little more about why this would happen at such an early age in a minute. But again, this is a close-up view. This so this is the front camel. This is the one where the lifter was collapsed as well or, or worn. And you can see this this wear here, this pitting. Uh, there's, you know, the case hardening on the camshaft is, is, is coming off. And as I said, there were several other lobes. The, the lifters on the others were all working fine, but it was only a matter of time before they, you know, all of this would tend to fail. So uh, these, uh, inter interestingly enough, this is not something you're going to find on an old 426 Hemi. The, the front cam journal is just going to be a big solid piece of metal. But these passageways, these are for the variable valve timing system. So up in the engine block, there are passageways and there's a, an electrically operated solenoid. and that changes the oil pressure out to the cam gear, which is located in this area here, and that can, that can adjust the valve timing of, of, of the engine. So that's, that's kind of how that's accomplished. So again, you know, as, as engines get newer, this is the same old kind of classic V8 that's been around for since the 50s, but mo modern modifications make it, make it work uh, better and more efficiently. Uh, lifters. These are the li this is a set of lifters. These, these are interesting. When, when you buy them, they basically come as a Normally, you just buy loose lifters. These come in, in this plastic holder here. And they're, uh, if you notice, there's little round holes in some of them and not in the others. This engine has um, a variable, uh, it's a variable displacement engine. So the, the computer can actually shut off 
uh, up to four cylinders in this engine while it's running for a better fuel efficiency and, and lower emissions. And uh, it does it with, with the lifters. It'll basically just depressurize these. So, so they basically, the camshaft and lifter moves, but it doesn't move enough to allow the valves to open. So they stay closed. So the cylinders are basically just causing no drag on, on the engine, very minimal. So it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting system. This is our worn out lifter here. I'm gonna get into a little closer picture so we can see some details of, of what was happening. It's a little subtle and a, a video may have been more useful, but if you notice, if you look at the gap between this point and that point, and then you look over here where the arrow is pointing, you'll see it's substantially lower. And uh, with, if I could grab this with my hand, I could, if I could show you, uh, but what we were able to do is actually this, this, this piece will move up and down and it's not supposed to do that. So there's, a, there's little needle bearings inside that have worn out and basically created a whole bunch of ex excessive play. And so that's, this is where our ticking noise is coming from. Also on the lifters, they're in this plastic retainer and there's a reason that it being a, being a roller, of course, this has to always roll in the proper direction. And apparently these fail. We have, I haven't seen one yet, but it's a reasonably common item where the plastic piece will break. And so the lifter will actually rotate sideways and, and not roll properly on the cam and of course that'll create uh, wear in a, in a real hurry so here's another kind of close-up view there's the lifter holder there's the uh there's the lifter that slips in and you can see it's got a it's grooved to fit properly in there what else do we have for pictures here i think we've i think we've covered oh yeah the engine so the, yeah there's the it's a four this is, this is a hemi you know it's like dodge's uh chrysler's made um Good use of their branding from the 60s. You know, you see in a lot of their vehicles, their Chargers, their uh, Cudas. You know, they, they a lot of the vehicles they sell are are, are uh, leftovers from the from the good old days in the late 60s, early 70s when 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 their engines had a huge amount of horsepower. This is this is a hemispherical cylinder head. The you know, thing one thing's different about this over the uh, the original 426 Hemi, of course, is that this is a, it's a smaller engine displacement wise, uh, but it also has two spark plugs, so it. And uh, as far as for details, I, I, assume, I assume these are both fired at the same time, but there are some engines that do use two spark plugs, again, for just better combustion. Uh, it's kind of added complication. And of course, when you have to change the spark plugs, it, it uh, doubles the price, but you know, it, uh, they do last a long time. So that's our picture show for the engine. Now, I do have some other items if you want to ask me the next question. Did you find anything else while, while the engine was up? Yeah. So the... Um, so the other item we, that I did notice while, we, while, while the engine was out is that you can, see a, uh, you can see some coolant leakage, very subtle amount of coolant leakage. You can see sort of a, this is the, this is the front left oxygen sensor, and you can see some crusty buildup around this oxygen sensor. And there's a, a heater pipe right, right, above, right above this, and so very slight amount of coolant's been leaking, who knows how long onto this oxygen sensor. So it just made a lot of sense to change this part while the engine was out because of course you could actually get right in there and do it. I mean, it's not a hideous job while the engine's in, but the oxygen sensors are actually a real pain to change in this vehicle. Very, very inaccessible. There was, there was a lot of good things about doing this engine job, but the location of the oxygen sensors wasn't one of them. So we changed this oxygen sensor and these heater pipes. And I'll just get a little closer view of of this kind of thing. There again, you can see a little bit of the crustiness. And this is a, it's interesting. It's a little, it's an assembly, a pipe assembly. It has a plastic elbow that goes through, uh, through the uh, firewall. Uh, and then there's a couple other hoses at the other end that attach to the actual, uh, this is actually in the, like I should say, this is in the cowl area and the firewall is actually further back, but they, it needs this adapter to run the hose through the cowl. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, close up view, there's the oxygen sensor with the uh, crusty deposits on it. Again, we changed that while the engine was out. It, it, I mean, it, it, as far as we know, it was working fine beforehand, but you never know how, how you know, that with that kind of stuff dripping on it, it, it'll definitely shorten the lifespan. And there's one final picture. So this is that hose assembly. So, you know, I, I wanted to just get this elbow, but of course, being a modern vehicle, they only sell the hose assembly. Good news is it wasn't very expensive, which is good. And it came with all the quick connect ends down here, which clip onto the heater pipes of the engine and the hoses, you know, it comes with clamps. So the actual removal and reassembly process is actually pretty straightforward because it comes with all the parts and pieces you need. You don't need to, you don't need to hunt around. Do we have clamps? How do they go together? They, it's pretty straightforward. So, but you know, I often wonder, you know, this, this vehicle's on, you know, eight years old, what's gonna happen when it's 15? Oh, we, sorry, we don't sell that part anymore. Then you gotta start custom making stuff and kind of annoying that way. So I'm back. So you mentioned the mileage, it wasn't that high on this vehicle? No, only yeah, about 114,000 kilometers. It's really a pretty young, young vehicle, low mileage. 
so that's kind of early for this sort of catastrophic wear to be already taking place. I would consider that to be so. Um, and you might want to ask, well, why would that happen? And I think uh, I mean, there's always manufacturing defects and things that aren't made as well as they should be. But I mean, really, this is where it's critical to change your oil on time or early uh, every time. And you know, when this vehicle was brought to us, um, you know, it, had, it was a little overdue for an oil change. It was a little low on oil, not critically. But those kind of things can all make a difference. You, know, you just get a little slight lack of lubrication. Uh, or the oil just breaks down a little too much, it's, it's a little too old, that, that kind of thing will cause this sort of wear to happen on engines. And, uh, you know, and, and you never know from engine to engine. We have, we have, we have customers who abuse the crap out of the car. Uh, we had a Subaru yesterday where the owner brought it in, and, and every time she's like, you know, she's like 5,000 kilometers overdue for an oil change. I'm like, ah, oh, it's like, you know. And she's been doing it for years. So, there are, so I'm not saying, you know, like you can get away with it in some cars because some people go, oh yeah, well I did that. Well, yeah, okay, you're lucky because you know there's people who, who you know, drink a case of beer a day and smoke you know five packs of cigarettes and live to a hundred, but they're kind of rare. Like they're they're they are the very rare exception. <laughs> so so with cars, it's like change the oil. I mean that's that's really the critical thing. Change it when it's due, even a little before it's due. Could we make an assumption that this car was probably not? really driven for long distances, like taken out and driven, you know, 250 miles in one go kind of thing. It's been all stop and start in town. And that's even more critical for making oil changes on time. It, it is it, absolutely. That's a really good point. You know, when, when, if you do a lot of straight highway driving, you can, you can actually stretch your oil change interval out even longer because the engine's hot, it's warm, it's everything's moving. Uh, very, very good point, Mark. You know, it's uh it, it, the city stop and go traffic is even harder on it. So, you know, cold starts and, you know, that's, that makes a huge difference. So, yeah, I mean, even, even then it, it's worth changing the oil probably more often. And a lot of sitting probably with a eight year old vehicle that's only got 60,000 miles or 70,000 miles on it. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, a, not a huge amount of use. Or Jeep Grand Cherokees overall. Well, you can always, uh, thank you for, thank you for bringing that. Uh, overall, uh, I mean, well, you know, to me, this is kind of a, you know, a, a, a bad stain on the reputation of a Jeep. And if you do a lot of research, you'll find a lot of these 5.7 liter engines have, have similar issues. You know, you and I do a lot of podcasts on Jeeps because there are a lot of things that happen to them. This, this particular Jeep, it's a beautiful, like a, it's a really beautiful vehicle, really nice to drive. It looks great. And I think Grand Cherokees have always been like that. I mean, they're really, they're a really nice vehicle. Um, but they do, they do have a lot of issues. I mean, this one, we, we, on this particular vehicle, and I think he's a fairly recent owner, uh, secondhand, you know, we, we've actually rebuilt the transfer case on it because it had an issue. So, you know, it's had a, it's had a number of problems at a, what I would consider a pretty early age. I mean, I have a 2001 Suburban, knock on wood, I've never rebuilt the transfer case. And it's got, you know, triple the mileage of this vehicle. Um, so, you know, there, there are, there are a lot of things that do happen to Jeeps. Um, and it could be that this one just suffered from some bad maintenance. Uh, you know, that, that does, that does happen. And that's unfortunately the risk when you buy a used vehicle, which, which is good to really look at, uh, you know, if you're getting a used vehicle, if you can look at the maintenance schedule, because you're, you know, there are, there are some risks, but uh, th I'd say, you know, like for Jeeps, there are definitely more issues than, than, than average. So if you want to look after your Jeep in Vancouver, the guys to see are Pollock Automotive. You can reach them at 604-327-7112 to book your appointment. You have to call and book ahead because they're busy. You can't just walk in. And they're only servicing people in Vancouver. So we appreciate your calls and interest from all across North America, but we can only serve you in the Vancouver, BC area, other than maybe some other circumstances. Check out the website, pollockautomotive.com. Of course, on our YouTube channel, Pollock Auto Repair, hundreds of videos and articles about all makes and models of and repairs over many years now. And of course, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for watching.